Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first, I want to recognize uh, uh, this 4-H mask that I'm delighted with. I think it's the first uh, monogrammed uh, mask that I've had. And uh, this is made by Faith Fritch of Hiawassee, Arkansas. She's a 4-H member, and uh, the teams uh, have made more than 30,000 face masks that have been made and don donated by volunteer groups affiliated with the Cooperative Extension Service, uh, from Extension Homemakers to Master Gardeners to Extension Get Fit and 4-H clubs. So uh, thank you, uh, Faith, for the excellent uh, mask that I will wear, and as a former 4-H member, I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, today I'm enjoyed, joined by Dr. Uh, Nate Smith, Secretary of uh, Department of Health. Uh, we have our Secretary of Agriculture here who's worked on uh, some of these issues very specifically with the task force. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Michelle Smith. Uh, we'll have some comments uh, in, related to uh, some minority health issues and some other things. And then uh, we got uh, Secretary Mike Preston that's here uh, as well. Uh, yesterday, we reported 3,255 uh, COVID-19 cases in Arkansas. Uh, there's been an additional 66 cases that have been reported or tested positive. So we now have 3,321. Uh, there has been uh, no new hospitalizations. Excuse me. Yes, that's right. There's no new hospitalizations. We're still at 95 three additional deaths, so it brings us to 64 in terms of Arkansans who've died because of COVID-19. Uh, we did have uh, 1,786 tests that were done. Uh, and so if you'll remember uh, when we had our two-day surge, we were hoping for 1,500 tests during each of those two-day periods. And yesterday we had over 2,000 tests, today over 1,700 tests. So uh, the surge not only worked for those two days, but we've had a continued uh, good response on tests. Uh, if you will look briefly at the uh, charts uh, that are the same as what we ordinarily present, uh, the number of new COVID cases in Arkansas going back to March 11, of course this starts out with about two, uh, goes up to 102, and uh, this is the 300 level that we reached on one particular day when we had the expansive numbers in uh, Cummins Maximum Security Facility. And so you can see that uh, uh, we're, we're down, we're a little level today. And then if you go to the uh, next uh, graph, we have our seven day rolling average of new cases in Arkansas with the orange line reflecting the seven day rolling average. Uh, so that continues to show the trend line uh, in a downward trajectory. Uh, and then if you'll go to the next site, we have the number of hospitalized, uh, which is down and steady uh, under 100. Uh, and so uh, those are the information points that we have today in terms of cases. And that leads me to an announcement today. Uh, as we've indicated, we're lifting some restrictions. Uh, uh, looking at uh, next week to lift different restrictions. Yesterday, on May the 4th, we'll be lifting the, we announced that we'll be lifting the restrictions on gyms and indoor recreational facilities. And today, I'm very pleased with Mother's Day approaching, coming up, we all want a haircut uh, or some type of uh, uh, treatment. And professionals also want to safely return to the business that they love and enjoy. And so today I'm announcing that barber shops and hair salons will be open for business next Wednesday, May 6th. And uh, the reason it is May 6th is because uh, that gives some time in uh, preparation to open up with the necessary restrictions that are in place, uh, but it also gives you a couple days before Mother's Day as well. And these lifting of restrictions apply to barber, cosmetology, massage therapy, body art, and medical spa services, all one-on-one -on -one engagement. And that's the reason, of course, that we uh, put the restrictions on to begin with. But I want to applaud uh, Dr. Smith and his team for working with the industry, uh, working with the licensing authorities as well, to develop uh, some safety criteria 
for uh, these uh, facilities. One of them is 10 or fewer people in the facility, and that would be for the smaller facilities, but if they're larger facilities, then no more than 30% of the stations uh, can be operational at one time. Uh, no walk-in appointments has to be done by reservations. Clients should wait outside or in cars until ready. Uh, time should be set between appointments for cleaning. The six foot distance between clients during appointments uh, in the waiting area. Uh, clients' names and contact information must be recorded, obviously, if. Uh, we need to do some contact tracing. We will have that information available. And of course, the vulnerable populations need to think about uh, whether they should be out. Uh, they still maybe should be uh, avoiding uh, places that you go out and could possibly jeopardize your health. And then if this uh, gives some additional requirements, face coverings are required for staff and clients must also wear as services permit. Obviously, uh, if you're uh, getting a facial, you take your mask off, and so you have to be practical about that. Gloves should be worn, hands must be washed before and after services, screening of staff and clients, uh, similar to uh, temperature, travel, uh, contact with COVID-19 uh, positives, and then if there's any question, they ought to be postponed uh, if there's any symptoms that causes concerns, thoroughly clean. When it says school's not uh, included, this would be for, for the wide open cosmetology or barber schools. Uh, they're still uh, restricted uh, to a greater extent. Uh, this is simply an outline of what uh, the guidelines reflect and, and uh, directive reflects. For all the specific language, go to the Department of Health website. And of course, this is phase one is what I just went through. As we continue to improve our numbers, if we continue to uh, make the progress we want to see in the state, then we'll go to phase two that can increase the number of people inside and we'll lift some of these uh, different restrictions as you can see. And of course, we all want to eventually get to phase three where it's normal operations. But this is what we need to do to have access uh, for our barbers, shops for our beauty salons and other uh, salons of this kind, and then we'll uh, move on through this phased approach. And then uh, with that, uh, I want to recognize uh, Dr. Smith uh, to make his comments, and then followed by uh, Dr. Michelle Smith, who again, we're delighted to have join you. Then I'll come back and uh, uh, give an update on our uh, business loans, and then uh, we'll take questions. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, it is exciting to be able to open up uh, businesses rather than close them down. Uh, I also was wearing a special mask, um, and uh, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Michelle Smith explain this mask to you because she does a better job um, when she comes up. Uh, I want to give some detail on the numbers and just a, a couple other quick uh, pieces of information. As the governor uh, has already said, we had 66 new cases uh, yesterday, uh, bringing our total to 3,321. Uh, five of those cases were from uh, correctional facilities. Now, not all the cases uh, from the uh, Federal Correctional Institute and Forest City have been ent entered into our database yet, so those will continue to be added as we go along. But of those 66, five are from that facility. We have, uh, as the governor mentioned, uh, 95 currently hospitalized, which is the same as yesterday, 23 on a ventilator, which is the same as yesterday. Uh, we are up to 64 deaths. That's three more than yesterday. And as, a, as an aside, one of those was a nursing home related uh, death. And so we have a total of our 64 deaths of those 23 are nursing home related. Our nursing homes, uh, we have a total of 229. That's up seven from yesterday. And uh, for nursing home staff, 142. That's also up seven from yesterday. We are following uh, uh, con uh, contact investigations in 40 uh, nursing homes currently. Uh, we, uh, I would like to give a brief update also on, our, on the Federal Correctional Institute. 
Um, uh, we are working with the CDC team that is there doing the testing. Uh, we're uh, providing support as needed as well. Uh, they now have 135 inmates. That's up 34 uh, from yesterday. Um, uh, those are not all yet in our system, uh, but they will be added. Uh, one major change to our numbers, uh, we have gone through and um, uh, categorized those who have recovered. Um, uh, we've done a better job of categorizing those, and as we've looked, uh, we now um, have a, a total of 1,973 who have recovered. And that's up 668 from yesterday, but that's because we went back and uh, you know, recategorized those uh, who had not been uh, properly categorized as recovered. So our total active case count right now is 1,284. Uh, two brief announcements. Uh, one is um, uh, with the governor's blessing uh, this morning, um, I've, uh, 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 I'm a appointing a, uh, a COVID-19 dental advisory group uh, to help us uh, prepare the uh, directive, uh, give input on that directive uh, for dentists to resume their, uh, at least some of their activities with limitations on May 18th. And so we're looking forward to having both uh, representatives from, from the dental uh, side and also the dental hygienists on that advisory group. And that uh, we plan to have them meet uh, early next week. We also, uh, and I've already given an update on the Federal Correctional Institute and so with that, I'll turn it back over to the governor. Would you go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Smith? Yes, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Michelle Smith. She is director of our Office of uh, Health Equity. Uh, she is also, her full title is uh, director of the Office of Health Equity and HIV Elimination because she has played a pivotal role in our HIV elimination, uh, ending the HIV epidemic uh, work. Uh, she's also been working very closely with the uh, 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 barber shops and beauty salons uh, through um, uh, various initiatives uh, the um, and which I'll let her explain uh, and um, most recently helping develop uh, a webinar to help uh, them implement this guidance uh, that is uh, going out in the directive today so dr. Smith I'll turn it over to you thank you dr. Smith and I also like I'll always like to say of no relation um, thank you both um, for having me here to briefly talk about some of the work that our office is doing to address health disparities as they relate to COVID-19. But before I begin, I do want to make mention that the masks that Dr. Smith and I are, are wearing are from Arkansas's own fashion designer, Kato Mumalu from Project Runway. So we thank her for providing these for us. So the mission of the Office of Health Equity at the Department of Health is to provide leadership, support, and advocacy for equitable practices that reduce disparities in Arkansas. While we are seeing the, that the minority population are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, we know that this problem did not just happen overnight. We also know that the higher prevalence of underlying conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, and obesity are all related to what we call the social determinants of health. And by this, we mean issues such as poverty, limited access to health insurance, affordable housing, and fewer healthy food options, just to name a few. While this pandemic is affecting all of us, it is also calling us to address these inequities in our society. Solving such heavy problems may seem impossible today, However, it's important that we recognize these issues so we can come together and find solutions for the future. One way the Department of Health is working to address these issues is by forming collaborations with partners such as historically black colleges and universities and even sororities and fraternities. Another partner is the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame Foundation, who has supported efforts to improve health and wellness among underserved populations since 2003. We are pleased to announce that as of this morning, they launched their COVID relief initiative. And under this project, many grants of up to $1,000 will be awarded to organizations addressing hardships due to COVID-19. We look forward to assisting them in identifying where the most need exists so resources can quickly be disseminated to those areas. We also have partnerships with minority barber and beauty salons 
where we have provided health screenings and follow-up care to customers. Because of our long-standing relationships that began in 2013, we created a learning series called Cut and Counsel. This is where barbers and stylists receive training to provide health education and even blood pressure readings to their clients. To help reduce COVID-19 transmission among employees and customers, we are offering a free seminar on Tuesday, May 5th from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m and the link to RSVP will be available on the ADH website. Again, this work requires all of us, and we are proud to work with other partners, such as the Arkansas Medical, Dental, and Pharmacy Association, the Arkansas Minority Health Commission, the Division for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at UAMS, the Marshallese Coalition, Arkansas United, and the Hispanic Women's Organization of Arkansas. And lastly, on a personal note, I just want to thank everyone that is working so diligently to ensure that masks are available for everyone. We're happy that some of the funds that are gonna be made available from the Arkansas Black Hall of Fame will go towards um, providing cloth masks for those that may not have access to them. While they may be difficult to wear at times, they do serve an important purpose, and behind every mask is a story. I wear my mask because when I go to the office, I want to protect the people that are working hard to improve the health and well-being of all our Kansans. I also wear a mask to protect my parents who are over the age of 65. My dad wears his mask when he goes to the grocery store to protect my mom who was hospitalized earlier this year. So when I go home every night and watch the news, I know what it's like to have a loved one in the ICU. Fortunately, my mom has been home from the hospital since February, and she only leaves for doctor's appointments. So when she does go out, she also wears a mask, and she wears this mask to protect the providers who continue to provide great care for her. So that's my story. So now I hope that when businesses reopen, I hope everyone will please remember to look past the mask and see a story. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for your devotion uh, to our uh, cause of health here in Arkansas and for your passion and uh, for your leadership. Uh, before we turn it over to questions, I did want to bring you up to date on the Ready for Business grants. As you know, there was $15 million uh, allocated from the uh, CARES Act funding for grants to small businesses. Uh, across Arkansas that need assistance in making sure their place of business has the uh, tools that they need to be COVID-19 compliant to put in the public health measures that uh, are needed and that we are requiring. Uh, because of the overwhelming demand for this, uh, the legislature uh, encouraged more money to be put into it, and so the uh, CARES Act Steering Group approved today $85 million additional dollars to go into this grant program. This is now subject to legislative review, uh, and they are currently reviewing that, and we will uh, report back, of course, whenever they complete their review and uh, give their decision uh, in regard to uh, that funding. With that, we'll be happy to uh, turn it open to any questions. Governor, today a group of protesters gathered outside the governor's mansion to urge for a eviction moratorium to stop evictions during this pandemic. Is that something that you're looking into maybe putting in place here? We're continuing to monitor it. Obviously, we don't want landlords taking advantage of the situation. Uh, and so if there is anyone that is being evicted for non-payment of rent and that because they lost their job because of COVID-19, uh, then we would encourage you to reach out. Uh, that's exactly why we set up the uh, funding at the Community Foundation to provide assistance to nonprofits that will reach out and help in these kind of circumstances. So there is relief and help for you if you find yourself in that circumstance. But evictions are still being filed in the state, even though the courts aren't proceeding right now, that doesn't mean that they won't once they're all opened back up again. So all those eviction filings will still take place. 
Well, the filings can take place, but as you said, the courts aren't acting on those. And of course, they could have uh, an eviction notice being given because it was operating illegally. It could be because they were uh, out uh, non-payment of rent six months ago and not because of COVID-19. So there could be a whole host of reasons we don't know about. And that's why it's important <clears throat> that if you can't pay your rent because of losing your job, because of a lack of income, because of COVID-19, there is help for you and we want to be able to help in those circumstances. <clears throat> in response to the recent ACLU uh, lawsuit uh, challenging the requirement for potential abortion clients to have COVID-19 tests that were able to get them, can you comment on that? Well, once again, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, struck down Judge Baker's ruling and said uh, the state's restrictions are appropriate in this health emergency. Uh, this uh, requirement is consistent with uh, that public health emergency and applies across the board to all uh, elective procedures. And uh, so, uh, you know, we'll see uh, what Judge Baker does, but uh, we, we believe that this is consistent with what the Eighth Circuit guidance has been and what they've affirmed as an appropriate action of the state. In regards to evictions, uh, there's some that are using the, the loophole of uh, filing an unlawful detainer, which can result in an eviction without having to have a, a proceeding of any kind. Well, here again, if it, there's a lot of different reasons that uh, a landlord might need to take action, a whole host of different reasons. I'm concerned about those that might have lost a job because of COVID-19 and they need fin financial assistance. We want to help them. I don't think the right answer is to uh, use my executive power and to uh, stop all proceedings in the state of Arkansas regardless of the reason. Uh, and so uh, I think it's a much more appropriate response to say, if you've lost your job because of COVID-19, you can't pay the rent. We want to be able to make sure you get the assistance that you need, and we can direct you in the right way. Regarding the uh, uh, hair salons and barbershops, uh, how will those restrictions be enforced? And uh, also, do you have plans to get a haircut? Do I have plans to get a haircut? Well, I can certainly answer. The answer is yes. I do have plans to get a haircut. and. Uh, uh, but I, I got a feeling I might have to wait in line because there's going to be a lot of reservations being made over the first three days of next week. Uh, but everybody is so excited about this, uh, ladies and gentlemen both, and uh, the time is right. There's a great need for it. In terms of the enforcement of the policy, uh, I have a great, great deal of confidence that our uh, stylists, uh, our salon owners are going to work very hard. That's one of the reasons I'm delighted with the webinar that they're doing the instructions for this. Uh, they want to make sure they protect both themselves and their patients. But if there's some outliers that aren't doing the right thing, Dr. Smith, has, I mean, why don't you explain how you're going to enforce that? Well, all, all of these uh, facilities that will be opening up are either licensed by the Department of Health or Department of Labor and Licensing under Secretary Bassett. Um, so we have our inspections, uh, we have our normal ways we'll act on any complaints, uh, much as we would with uh, these, uh, these industries are already uh, practicing a lot of infection control uh, protocols and uh, these will be treated just like those for as long as we need these additional directives. There. Walk us through, if when I go to my barber shop, is my barber going to be taking my temperature and logging that down? Is, is that, did I understand that correctly? Well, I would, I would prefer to refer you to the directive because there's a lot of, of points in there. Uh, some of the main ones that are protective is, is limiting the number of people in the, in the facility. And instead of having people wait in line, um, they'll wait in their cars until their appointment. That will limit the number of interactions. Uh, those who are um, uh, working there will be wearing the cloth masks uh, for source control and we also uh, want the customers to wear them except uh, when it's not possible. Um, uh, there are some, some types of things that uh, it's not possible to wear a mask but to be as safe as, as possible and we have some other protocols uh, that, um, that uh, are in there that uh, will be part of that webinar for training. 
happened into the, uh, the recategorizing recate of the, the recoveries? Well, we had, uh, we had individuals who um, really had recovered from their infection weeks ago, but for whatever reason, we weren't able to contact them to verify that. Um, so uh, we, if they'd been beyond two weeks, uh, we went ahead and um, reclassified them. If they, if they weren't in a hospital or something of that sort, we went ahead and reclassified them as, as recovered. We were accumulating a lot of individuals who we knew had recovered. We just weren't able to get them on the phone. Uh, let's uh, go remotely. Is there any question remotely? Yeah, yeah Governor, this is uh, Andrew with AP. Um, going back to the grant program, uh, from, from that steering committee uh, meeting this morning, it sounded like there's still frustration among some lawmakers over this rollout and uh, some, uh, some hesitance about, about the amount of money that you're seeking. I want to see why, why you're seeking the amount of money that you are. And, uh, you know, what are you doing to you know, talk with the lawmakers who are concerned about uh, you know, the, the premature posting of the application and just concerns that they have that this was not a fair rollout of the application process? Well, I think it's been uh, fully explained uh, yesterday uh, and uh, on other occasions as to uh, what happened, uh, as to where this amount of money came from. It actually came from members of the General Assembly uh, who uh, su suggested uh, that they wanted to have more money put in there. And so uh, this request is in response to uh, discussions with the General Assembly to make sure that everyone had a good opportunity to apply for these uh, uh, small business grants. Uh, that they uh, could have the assistance that uh, this grant is designed for. Uh, and, you know, to illustrate it, uh, uh, from what we've seen so far, I think it was 92% of the grants, uh, the applicants had 50 or fewer employees. That is really the definition of small business. And so uh, the need is great there. They suggested more money, uh, and uh, that's the reason the uh, CARES Act uh, steering group approved additional funding and uh, you know if it's up to the legislature now as to whether they want to give the appropriation to accomplish that or not or at what level and so uh, that's a little bit of the history of it we're working with them hope we'll have a good outcome for all the uh, uh, small businesses that are struggling in Arkansas and that need this assistance one more remotely governor Yes, Governor, I was wondering about unemployment benefits for folks who could possibly return to work. You're talking about opening salons and gyms within the next week or so. What about folks who are currently receiving unemployment benefits? Will they no longer be able to receive those benefits if their restaurant or salon reopens and they still don't feel comfortable coming to work? All right, that's a great question. I'm going to let Secretary Preston supplement this. but. Uh, first, in terms of the barbers and salon operators, they're entitled to pandemic unemployment assistance, uh, which is like unemployment payments, but it is for the self-employed. And uh, so they are entitled to that, and even though they will be going back uh, into operation, they'll still be able to recoup uh, that kind of assistance going back to whenever they close their business. And because we're still building the system for them to get that money, they have not received those funds yet, so certainly they shouldn't be penalized because of that, and they'll be able to go back and recoup it. And uh, Mike, do you want to add to that? Thank you, Governor, and, and that's uh, exactly correct, that they'll be able to uh, go back and backdate to when um, uh, they were first affected by the, the pandemic. Uh, for those who are eligible, you mentioned in uh, like a restaurant who are trying to get their employees back, uh, if they have been offered uh, their employment back and they choose not to, then that is on their own doing. And then it is on the employer to notify the Department of Workforce Services that this employee is refusing to come back to work and therefore if they still continue to claim their benefits, uh, then they need to be notified and that's a fraudulent claim for us and we will be tracking Tracking that. Uh, something really related to that. Um, it, like, let's say it's a restaurant that chooses not to reopen its dining room, even though now they technically will be able to on May 11th. Mm -hmm. Would those employees still be eligible for the unemployment benefits? If, they're, uh, if their operation is still closed and they're not able, uh, able to go back to employment, then yes, they'll still be eligible for benefits. 
update us on self-employed private contractors, the status of that system? Uh, we are in the testing phase and hope to have that uh, in a matter of days ready to go. Uh, remotely, is there any question remotely? I have a question for Dr. Michelle Smith. Yes, Dr. Smith. Um, for... Uh, go ahead, we're listening. So, um, all right. With this cut in council, uh, will this enable testing and screening for minorities who have had uh, trouble getting access to testing? Could, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? About minorities having trouble getting access yeah. to testing. So, program that you mentioned, um, does that include getting access for screening or testing? Uh, unfortunately, it does not. We are focusing only on providing information related to the guidance. We are going to have about 30 minutes um, for question and answers. And so if any individuals pose questions related to that, we will definitely take that back to our physicians group and try to get them some, some answers. Any other questions? Yes, thank you. Um, for, well, for the governor. Um, Sorry. Uh, just to kind of clarify this point, you know, the White House had its guidelines for beginning the first phase of reopening. Did you determine that we, in terms of the trajectory of cases, that we met those guidelines or that, did you use a different criteria or what was the determination on that? Uh, if you recall, uh Oh, three or four days back, I went through those gating criteria for phase one and compared them to where we are in Arkansas. And in my judgment, as we presented that, we met those gating criteria. Uh, and, uh, it's, and the key, everybody focuses on the 14 days of going down in the trajectory of cases, but it has that alternative, which is uh, reducing on the trajectory of positivity of your testing. And so uh, that was uh, my judgment. But again, uh, there's a great deal of flexibility as to how we measure uh, where we are in Arkansas. But I did see us meeting uh, that gating criteria. Dr. Smith, I want to invite you to make a comment on that as well. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I agree with the, what the governor said. Basically, these gating criteria are uh, designed to assess two things, basically. First of all, how much uh, transmission, how much spread of COVID-19 is going on uh, within the community, and also uh, how taxed are those uh, medical resources. And we want to make sure that uh, we have decreasing amounts of transmission, uh, or at least stable. Um, and then uh, we also want to make sure that we're not overtaxing our healthcare system. and. Uh, all these uh, numbers are, are designed to try and get at those two, those two issues. And so we've looked at the, the number of folks who have COVID-19-like symptoms uh, using both our syndromic surveillance system called Essence, our um, ILI net, influenza-like illness uh, network, um, and then also looking at the daily case counts, uh, looking at the seven-day rolling average uh, for those as well and then also uh, looking at the percentage of positive tests because during this time we've uh, almost doubled the number of uh, tests that are being done each day. So, um, you know, the more you test, the more you're likely to find. Uh, so we don't want to um, uh, assume that we have more transmission just because we're detecting more cases. Uh, perhaps uh, one final question. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, this, this past week, Jacksonville Mayor refused to open community storm shelters when those tornado warnings were, were issued because of the, the whole 10 person limit? Uh, actually, I admit to uh, have a conversation with Dr. Smith about that, but uh, the answer is that uh, when you're in an emergency situation in which uh, lives are at risk, uh, you've got the authority to waive rules and to do what's necessary to save lives. And uh, just like uh, we give mayors uh, the authority to coordinate with us in terms of, of uh, curfews, uh, they also certainly have the authority to use their executive power in uh, emergency circumstances to uh, save lives. Thank you all very much.